welcome to part three of Man Media Movie Month. This week we're going to be looking at... Oh, Dan, we have a problem. The script is, well, it's way too long. I mean, I know we want dense, but this is just crazy. Scanning through this, you have notes on objectification, observer's paradox, infinite regression, active agents, passive agents, fungibility, viability, subjectivity, instrumentality, ownership, narrow definition of masculine, and fetishization. We could spend the next year working through these subjects and still not be done. Yeah, I know, but all of that stuff. You also have two movies, 300 and Fight Club, as the centerpiece, callbacks to Transformers, and references to Zardoz, and you're trying to provide context for all of them. Yeah, but... Here, how about I read you a choice quote and you tell me how this sounds out loud. In the context of analyzing objectification, the observer's paradox takes on an additional problematic dimension. The observer must try to observe objectification using a brain that is physically constructed to objectify everything external to itself. More than just a paradox, this is an infinite regression because the solution to the problem raises the same question that was asked in the first place, leaving us with a paradox inside a paradox. Even worse, due to the fundamental nature of the problem at hand, the solution requires an objective point of view that would be so alien to the human point of view that the answer would be incomprehensible and thus useless. Honestly, you have to trim this. It's, it's just too much for a 15 minute episode. So what do we cut? First, cut the Zardoz reference and the callback to Transformers. I agree that it's interesting to point out that Michaela is an active agent within the story, yet is treated by a prop by the camera, but save that for an episode on visual characterization. Second, tone down the paradoxes. Next, get down to the core. What is objectification, how does it work, and where does it go wrong? Finally, Fight Club in 300. You have to pick one. But, you have to pick, man. All right, on one hand, Fight Club has a lot of these questions baked right into the movie. Men's relationships with themselves and each other, their relationships with women and their parents, uh, objectification in media and its impact on individuals and society, and the movie sends mixed messages by condemning the very things that it's made out of, effectively demonstrating the paradoxical nature of the problem. Yes. On the other hand, 300 is so over the top with its fetishization of the hypermasculine and the progressive dimensional dehumanization of the other that you can basically use it as a scientific unit of measure. Mm -hmm. This is Sparta! Ah, what the? It's 117 minutes of sex, violence, and one-liners. The performances are sound, the characters are enjoyable, the style is interesting, and the tone is consistent. As far as junk food entertainment goes, you can do a lot worse. And in a certain way, I think it even does exploitation and objectification right. Or, well, as right as you can do them. So, let's talk about it. 300 is a sticking point for me because I know that on many levels it's an irresponsible film, but I still love it. I love its reckless disregard for substance, its self-indulgent style, and its complete lack of self-awareness. Every character is so thoroughly stereotyped and exploited, I'm amazed no one twirls their mustache while monologuing about evil. Like this guy. Man, don't you just want to monologue and twirl that sucker? Yeah, that's right. The story revolves around half-naked white men murdering foreigners and coded gays in a fantasy version of the Battle of Thermopylae. King Leonidas leads the men out in the battle while Queen Gorgo deals with the political intrigue back home. The 300 kill a bunch of soldiers, horses, ninjas, monsters, grenadiers, more monsters, and soldiers, and then everyone dies. Many of the complaints about the film stem from how thin the characters are and Zack Snyder's style over substance approach to filmmaking. And that's an absolutely fair observation to make. The characters are paper thin and generally disposable. Not people, just objects. A real simple way of illustrating this is by looking at names. How many characters from 300 can you remember by name? Leonidas? Xerxes? Ephialtes, maybe? I know I'm not that good with names to begin with, but I've seen the movie six or seven times now and there's at least a dozen characters whose names are only mentioned in passing once, maybe twice. For the most part, the Spartan soldiers are referred to as a collective horde, simply being called the 300. Even individuals are routinely referenced by their title or role in the story. The Hunchback, the Traitor, the Queen, the Son. So why are people not up in arms over this film's objectification of men? Well, it's complicated. 
Objectification is a challenging concept to work with because it covers a very wide range of behavior, from vital to survival on one end, all the way to morally decrepit on the other. At the most basic level, objectification is the mental process of turning abstract concepts and stimulus into objects. If that sounds broad, it's because it is. It's how your brain interprets the world around you. Everything from the words I'm saying to the chair you're sitting in to the idea of love is translated from raw stimulus into an object. The brain then takes these objects and files them away in a complicated storage system that relies heavily on patterns. If this sounds familiar, it's because we kind of already talked about this way back in the first episode. Semiotics, mimetics, language, and the use of symbols all stem from this process. Take those away and we lose civilization and society. Heck, in an evolutionary sense, this objectification and pattern recognition system was vital to our operation and survival, because without it, the brain would need to spend a ton of time and energy constantly decoding the information coming in. And that time and energy is the difference between living to have children and ending up as wolf chow. There's one more important aspect of this that we need to cover, and that's the idea of scale or dimension that's at work here. The further away you get from the individual, the less detailed the mental object becomes. A simple way of explaining this is to think of a crowd of people. Your brain doesn't see a collection of individuals, it just sees, well, a crowd and treats them all like a giant singular object. It's like this army here. You don't think, oh, that's a lot of individuals, you think, that's a really big army. So no matter what, in everyday life and in narrative, some level of objectification is inevitable. You're going to end up with disposable, interchangeable characters simply because less important characters are less important. The further you get from the main characters, the more object-like the characters get. That's just the reality of it. 300 provides perfect examples of this, to the point that you can practically draw it out as a chart. If you place Leonidas at one end, the further away you get, the less human the characters become. Literally. Leonidas, Xerxes, the Queen, the Greeks, the Hunchback, the Conscripts, the Immortals, the Monsters, the Animals. It's like... sedimentary layers. The Immortals are the example I love the most. They're built up as this super exotic fighting force, they're identified only as a collective group, and they all wear identical dehumanizing masks. But that's not all. Once the masks are off, they're grotesque with inhuman eyes, noses, and teeth. The Immortals are basically a checklist of objectifying features. Instrumentality. They're a tool, both for the plot and for Xerxes. In the story, their only purpose is to demonstrate that the 300 are mortal by killing a few of them off. Agency. They do what Xerxes commands without question and act as a swarm. Ownership. They're Xerxes' property. Fungibility. They're interchangeable and visually identical. Violability. There's no moral ambiguity in killing them. Subjectivity. Their feelings, motivations, and emotions are unimportant. There you go. Really, you only need one of those for a character to be considered an object, and these guys hit all six. If we go through the rest of the characters, almost all of them fall into one category or another. I'd probably say that Leonidas, Xerxes, Queen Gorgo, and Aphialtes escape that fate, but that's still a bit hazy with the Queen and Aphialtes. Alright, the film makes objects of all its characters, but to what end? Well, fetishism and exploitation. The core values of the film are obvious. Violence is awesome, manly men are awesome, girly men are evil, pecs are awesome, violence is awesome, sex is awesome, abs are awesome, women are awesome, traitors suck, and violence is awesome. That's... definitely not the most wholesome message ever. So, why do I like this movie? First, I would say it's fairness. Like Crank 2, it treats everyone with the same level of exploitation. Even the enemies get to be awesome. The Immortals? Awesome. This Executioner? Awesome. The Wizards? Awesome. And let's look at Xerxes for a second. He's coded queer, there's no question about that, and he's also foreign. As the film's antagonist, he's the epitome of the other. Exploitative? Very. But you know what? He's still awesome. Yes, he's the bad guy, and there's no question in the film's mind that he should be treated as such. But he's an awesome bad guy. The dude's ripped, he's like eight feet tall, and that voice. I will erase even the memory of Sparta from the histories. Every piece of Greek parchment shall be burned. Every Greek historian and every scribe shall have their eyes put out and their tongues cut from their mouths. Why, honoring the very name of Sparta or Leonidas will be punishable by death. The world will never know you existed at all. So awesome. 
He's the enemy, but he's an enemy you can get invested in, like Darth Vader. He's intimidating, powerful, and everything a good villain should be. And that brings us to the far end of the spectrum. Where does objectification go wrong? The answer in my mind is volume. Part of the reason I don't have a problem with the overt objectification of straight white men as violent maniacs in 300 is because it's just one junk food movie, and I have hundreds of other movies in my collection where straight white men are complex active agents within the story and not just plot objects. Other groups within society, well, aren't that lucky. When objectification or other mimetic techniques are used repeatedly, you get a stereotype. The noble leader, the slimy traitor, the powerless good guy. The problem isn't stereotypes in and of themselves, it's when there's only stereotypes. And a lot of groups out there really only get one or two stereotyped roles to play over and over and over again. So I think the best question 300 can make us ask is one of empathy. What if every movie was 300? No kinda homely Tony Danza, no mutant Steve Buscemi, no dull-eyed Shia LaBeouf, no pale scrawny Dan Olson. Just sculpted violence machines. Yeah, I'd probably stop going to the movies too.